student, could you talk about the relationship between wisdom and samadhi and also the relationship between deep samadhi and enlightenment? Glassman. There's just a candle burning and giving off light. The light is the functioning of the candle. Wisdom in Buddhism has nothing to do with knowledge or intelligence. Wisdom is simply the functioning of what is. Student. But then what about Prajna wisdom? Is that a different kind of wisdom? Or is it wisdom in the broadest sense? And then is it an expression of a functioning of a particular kind of samadhi? Glassman. Just as there are many degrees of samadhi, so there are many kinds of wisdom. We talk about prajna wisdom, which we sometimes call the wisdom of emptiness. This is the wisdom of seeing the oneness of all things, which is the wisdom of deep samadhi. On the other hand, if my samadhi is weak and I'm attached to lots of different things, then that's the kind of wisdom that will emerge. We have difficulty because we want to think that wisdom is somehow different from our normal everyday functioning. But the statement, everything as it is, is Buddha nature, means exactly that. Ex enlightenment is just the experience of realizing this fact. In a way, it's a very simple fact, but we don't want to accept it. Somehow we expect wisdom or Buddha nature to be something special, something more. As for the relationship between Samadhi and enlightenment, we say that the depth of enlightenment depends on the depth of Samadhi. We study koans to clarify and polish our first insight until at some point we have another, much deeper realization. We then no longer have any doubt about why we practice or what direction our practice should take. But even at this point, if we stop practicing, our realization will fade and our samadhi will leak away. Samadhi is like a reservoir. When we sit, we're filling the reservoir. And as the reservoir gets fuller, we become more stable and more able to live our lives with confidence. Naturally, insights will arise and we let those insights go and continue our practice. Otherwise, we become attached to our realization and our samadhi dissipates. Student, many arts, particularly the martial arts, center on cultivating johri ki, the power of samadhi. In Tai Chi or Aikido, for example, this flow of energy is called Qi, and it is very important to develop and use it. How is Zen practice different from these practices? Glassman We call people who practice in this way Joriki junkies. 
or Samadhi freaks. They appear in Zen practice too. Zen practice is essentially letting go and going on. This doesn't mean we don't generate deep Samadhi, but that's not our emphasis. It's a byproduct. We don't stop at any particular inn, for example, the Joriki Inn. Our goal, if any, is to be completely free. This means that as we develop our Samadhi and use it, we have to let go of our attachment and go beyond it. Again, if our powers of concentration are only available for one particular art or discipline, this is not Zen Samadhi. In Zen, our Samadhi power should function 24 hours a day, every day, throughout our life. Student When I started practicing, I could see that my ability to relate to people or situations seemed to relate directly to the quality of my Samadhi. When I'd reach a barrier, I'd always feel that it was something in my sitting and I'd try to resolve it by sitting more. It was a very different experience when I tried to resolve the barrier by just staying and working with the situation, letting go of the idea that the best way to resolve it is to increase my Samadhi. Glassman I think this is true. What's also important is to practice consistently so that our Samadhi, our stability, just keeps steadily improving. I often hear people say, I used to sit really strong. I had tremendous Samadhi and now nothing seems to work right. But these same people are the ones of whom you'd say their practice has become so solid over these past few years. When we look at ourselves, we can't see it, but it is there. In our sitting, as we drop our attachment to our desires, we enter into Samadhi in the realm of form. Our sitting deepens to the point where we're not distracted by or attached to sensory impressions. It doesn't mean that they're not there. We're still aware of ourselves and of those things. So there's something of a split between ourselves and so-called externals. But then our sitting goes even deeper to the point where not only isn't there any attachment, but there's no division at all. A bell sounds. It is just the bell. No I exists. Nothing separate. There's a story of one Roshi who screamed out in pain when the bell was struck. He had become the bell itself. And then there's the story of the monk who was doing Zazen in an inn, working on the koan, the cypress tree in the garden. When a thief slipped in through the window, the thief shouted out in alarm and jumped back out of the window. All he saw was a cypress tree in the middle of the room. This is called the Samadhi of no form. 
The monk wasn't there anymore, only the tree. This is what Dogen Zenji is referring to when he says, For the sake of the water of wisdom, cultivate Samadhi well and do not let it leak out. Any kind of attachment, any kind of separation or clinging, no matter how small, is the leaking of Samadhi, the leaking of the water of wisdom. No leak means that not even the slightest attachment to anything remains. If the monk was aware of being the cypress tree, then his samadhi leaked. This state of no leak is difficult to attain, and in our koan study, we're asked to present the koan with that spirit. In any case, as we sit, our concentration becomes stronger and stronger. The gap between subject and object becomes less and less and we experience different levels of Samadhi. Yasutani Roshi says that after sitting 20 years, you can finally say that you've begun to learn how to sit, and that your Samadhi has matured. Many of us will take even longer than that. In a broader sense, Whatever state of mind we're in at any particular moment is our samadhi at that time. There's a famous koan in which a monk asks a young man, tell me, what is samadhi? And young man says, it's rice in the bucket. That is, it's everything that happens during the day. Eating rice, cooking meals, driving the car, sweeping the floor. We can observe samadhi in our work, study, watching television, or thinking. There's even the samadhi of gambling. It's rather easy to get into the kind of samadhi where we're absorbed in whatever we're doing. We call this samadhi in the realm of desire. We speak of three worlds, the realms of desire, form and no form. The worlds are not geographical or spatial, they exist in the mind. In the Diamond Sutra, it says that the three worlds are created by the mind. The realm of desire is the usual state of mind in which we live. We relate to the external world under the influence of conditioning created by our senses and awareness. When we see something, we are conditioned by what we see. We are very easily conditioned by thinking and so create all kinds of problems and frustrations. Strictly speaking, we don't call these conditioned states samadhi, even though they are concentrated states, such as in forgetting ourselves while abs absorbed in a movie. In the realm of form, strong attachment to the senses and awareness disappears. You are still attached to the existence of certain objects, though in a much more subtle way. The third realm, the realm of no form, is still more subtle and is subdivided into four different stages. Samadhi in the realms of form and no form is called fundamental samadhi. 
This is the samadhi we are in when we are genuinely practicing, when we can sit and concentrate well. Beyond that, there is one more state of samadhi, which is called the samadhi of no leaking. In this state, not even the slightest attachment to any thought remains. These are very technical descriptions and may not be especially helpful in the context of practice, but we should be aware that there are many different levels and kinds of samadhi. In Zen practice, what kind of samadhi should we develop? The Chinese sometimes translated the Sanskrit word samadhi as chen shao, literally right receiving. Right receiving. By concentrating well, we still the waves of the mind and are able to see things as they are. The waves are caused by the wind, thoughts and ideas. Of course there's nothing wrong with this wind, but when we are blown about by it, it causes difficulties. The practice of samadhi eventually cuts the source of this wind. Not forgetting right thought. From Dogen Zenji's text. The Buddha says, If you monks seek both a good teacher, and good protection and support, nothing is better than not forgetting right thought. For those who do not forget right thought, the thieving multitude of deluding passions cannot break in. For this reason you should always keep right thought in your mind and regulate it well. For if you lose this thought, all sorts of merits and virtues will be lost. If the power of this thought is strong and firm, then even though you mingle with the thieving five desires, you will not be injured, just as if you go into battle dressed in armour, you will not fear the enemy. This is the meaning of not forgetting right thought. In Japanese, not forgetting right thought is fu mo nen. Do not forget the thought. The character nen consists of two parts. The top part means ima right now at this very moment and the bottom part is shin mind the mind of this very moment this is nen don't forget the mind of this very moment protect the mind of this very moment Maintain the mind of this very moment. When we sit, what kind of mind do we have? Protect the mind of this moment and don't forget it. Without artificially trying to do anything, our life goes smoothly. This is not forgetting 
right thought. And the Buddha said there, if you really have right thought, it is like going into battle with armor. You can't get hurt. What kind of armor? What kind of battle? What kind of enemy is Buddha referring to? An analogy is always partial. We can't cover everything with an analogy. We should really understand what the Buddha is talking about when we practice the Buddha way. Who has to wear such protective armour? And from what must we protect ourselves? We have to understand that there is no fundamental need to wear armour or to protect ourselves from anything. What is the armour? It's you. Each of us can be either indestructible armour or our own worst enemy. We could be animals, hungry ghosts, fighting spirits, Buddhas or Bodhisattvas. For this reason you should always keep a right thought in your mind and regulate it well. If we take a step back and look at these teachings, we can see that they are also the three treasures, the very foundation of the Buddha way. What are the three treasures? The three treasures are nothing but you. To really maintain and protect the treasures is not forgetting right thought, then everything else will follow quite naturally. Just be one with the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. In other words, be your true self. Each of us has different characteristics and roles, and yet each of us is exactly the same. If you don't accept this, you are forgetting something. You are ignoring something. You are not maintaining right thought. You are not protecting right thought. Each of us is the Buddha Tathagata. When you truly maintain right thought, you are wearing the strongest armour and you don't need to wear anything to protect yourself. Being yourself, just maintain this, not forgetting right thought.